miners of Peru are on the march. It was in August this year that they came down to the streets of Lima in their thousands, down from the Andes mines that once served the Inca Empire. The miners were on strike for a total of 36 days. Almost every day there was a demonstration, march or protest meeting. Police and troops held back and let the miners march, for the simple reason that the country's whole economy depends on them. The miners know it, and the government knows it, because it's only the wealth from the metal mines, especially the copper, that stands between Peru and bankruptcy. Since August 1975, the country's president has been General Francisco Morales Bermudez. He was brought in by a bloodless army coup, and he insisted the military government would be revolutionary. It would draw its inspiration, he said, from socialist, humanitarian and Christian thought. And he's going ahead with plans to bring Peru back to full democracy. In June, the people had their first chance in 12 years to vote in elections. They were voting for the hundred seats in the Constituent Assembly, a body with the task of drawing up a new national charter, including presidential and congressional elections scheduled for 1980. Winner of the elections was the American Popular Revolutionary Alliance, whose leader is the veteran leftist Victor Raul Haya de la Torre. He became the Assembly's chairman. Here, he welcomes a pledge by the President guaranteeing full liberty of action to the Assembly. The President's promise was in contrast to earlier statements by the military government that the Assembly's work might be annulled if it produced a constitution incompatible with what was termed the aims of the Peruvian revolution of the armed forces. And so there's a sign here that Peru's economic crisis could be speeding up the return of consensus politics. The man charged with getting the economy back on its feet is the finance minister, Javier Silvaruete. The plan is based on a $310 million loan from the International Monetary Fund, which will help Peru to renegotiate its huge foreign debts, totaling $8.3 billion. The bitter pill is the austerity program being forced on the country as a condition of the IMF loan. More cuts in government spending, fewer subsidies, and fewer jobs in the public sector. In other words, hard times ahead for everyone. The fact is that the Peruvian central bank had completely exhausted its reserves of foreign currency and it looked like the sol would go on being devalued indefinitely. In the early 70s, foreign banks were falling over each other to lend Peru money, much of it going on arms and military hardware. But these creditors are now insisting that Peru gets its economic house back in order. The spiralling effect of devaluation and inflation is a familiar one. Even worse, while Peru's exports have fallen, imports have doubled in volume and quadrupled in value. This is bad news for many shopkeepers, because only the very rich can now afford to buy imported items such as these. And the well-off have probably got their cameras and stereo units already. Unfortunately, it's not only luxury goods that are hard to get. Peru can produce only half of its own food requirements, so anything imported has inevitably shot up in price even faster than homegrown produce, which, through inflation, now costs about four times what it did five years ago. Housewives find that shops and market stalls have simply run out of many basic foodstuffs. This woman says she can't get rice or sugar here, although she knows of another shop where she could. 
She also says she only has just enough money to do the shopping, and that her husband very seldom finds any work and gets too little money. This is the effect on ordinary people of what Peruvian economists are describing as the worst economic crisis of the century. Everyone has to tighten his belt. For instance, instead of beef or chicken, the people eat fish. At least Peru does have its own fishing industry, now picking up again after a couple of bad years. One way to bring in some extra money is to start a cottage industry at home. All you need is simple equipment, initiative and skill. This is Julian Velarde, who lives in downtown Lima. His main job is a set designer in a television studio, earning the equivalent of about 100 US dollars a month. At home, in his spare time, he paints, makes furniture and does wood carving. It all helps the family income to stretch that important bit further. So Julian, his wife Rosa, and their two daughters, Jackie and Carmen, are comparatively fortunate. Thanks to Julian's talent, they eat well and enjoy a better standard of living than most. The unlucky ones are the thousands of families living in the shanty town. These are mushrooms. The inevitable migration from countryside to town continues. Peru has a population of 16 and a half million, steadily rising, and 62% now live in the towns and cities. Also, two-thirds of all housing has neither sanitation nor running water, and infant mortality, for example, stands at 101 per thousand, six times the rate in the world's industrialized nations. Aware of the chronic housing problem, the government has a slum clearance program, but the austerity measures tied to the IMF loan mean there'll be cutbacks there too. The government payroll, nearly half a million strong, is already being reduced. Recently, 8,000 public sector employees were fired, and only the threat of widespread strikes prevented more from losing their jobs. The fact is that the economic plans of the military leadership over the past 10 years have failed to remove the gross inequality that if this crisis isn't controlled by the government, there could be a coup or even civil war. Up in the snow-capped Andes are the precious metal mines and the people who could make or break the latest rescue plans. The peasants and miners of the Peruvian Sierra have to thank the military revolution ten years ago for transforming the archaic social and economic structure of the country. But spokesmen for the far left, including mining union officials, say the military road has led not to socialism, but to a dead end. That's why these striking miners were seen by the government as such a big threat. It's become more than a strike over money and the reinstatement of 320 union leaders dismissed last year. For the unions are well organized, and they turned the strike into a general attack on the competence of the military government. There have even been calls for Peru to renege on its foreign debts, which, from the revolutionary viewpoint, grew out of loans used by imperialists to suppress the people. It all recalls the phrase of Fidel Castro that the Andes could become the Sierra Maestra of South America.
There's no denying that the miners put on a massive show of strength when they took to the streets of Lima. Although there were no major clashes in the capital, the government responded by sending in troops to key mining centres, declaring a state of emergency and suspending civil rights there. One reason given was that the miners were fermenting political agitation, and this seemed borne out when hospital workers joined in the strike. Police were deployed among the huge crowd that gathered outside the main hospital in Lima in support of their wage claims. The hospitals, being state-owned, are directly affected by government spending cuts. There are fewer jobs and only limited pay rises. Next, it was the civil servants themselves who appeared, carrying banners and chanting slogans, determined to get their slice of the economic cake if anyone get it out. One possible answer, the cabinet has drawn up redundancy and retirement schemes to encourage a threat in the workforce. Times of rampant inflation, now about 70%, it's regular work on not a payoff in cash. One massive project that could have saved Peru from much of its present embarrassment was the building of an oil pipeline right across the Andes, covering 850 kilometers from the Pacific coast to the Amazonian jungle. There, near the Corrientes River, in an area known as Trompeteros, the state-run Petro-Peru firm made what looked like a big oil strike in 1972. On the strength of this, and of other hopeful predictions, the pipeline was built at a cost of $1,000 million. It was financed in part by a Japanese consortium which is supposed to be paid back in part from 1979 in oil and petroleum products. However, there's not been much surplus oil after Peru's own needs have been met, and the project hasn't yet proved the big money spinner in exports as was hoped. Importantly though, the daily oil output of 150,000 barrels a day mean that Peru's saving a lot of foreign currency it would otherwise have to find. Five-sixths of the country's energy requirements are filled by gasoline. Because of the oil fine, it rose in price only slowly in recent years, compared with basic foodstuffs and services. But the recent austerity measures have slapped another 67% on prices at the pumps. Even so, gasoline remains a competitive bargain in such times of hyperflation. Exports and imports. For years now, more goods have been coming in than going out. The country's been consuming more than it's been producing. To make things worse, the interest on earlier loans means that over two-thirds of Peru's exports could go, not towards making the country richer, but simply in paying off these old debts. No wonder the government officially dubbed 1978 as the Year of Austerity, the slogan appearing on all official communiques. The question now is, what can they call 1979? Now the miners are back at work, but Lima will remember them for a long time to come. At least there were no bloody clashes on the streets. The miners' threat to resume their strike in October seems to have faded. Their disputes have in fact been referred to a committee of the Constituent Assembly. And if the deputies get involved in basic issues, rather than shouting objections from the sidelines, there's a better chance of the people accepting sacrifices for the common good. Otherwise, it could be total bankruptcy for Peru.